I, I want you to just imagine yourself saying, here I am, God. God will deliver you from anything that you can think of. But just as Isaiah admitted, Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips. And the angelic host cleansed them right there. All you have to do is recognize, I'm unclean. Just imagine yourself saying, here I am. Here I am, God. Greetings, City Church. Greetings to all of our wonderful members. And thank you to every visitor, every person who is viewing service and joining us in this worship experience today. We are so glad that you decided to join with us. And I truly pray that your experience so far has brought you into a deeper hunger to understand the validity that is in the scripture and to a place where you truly and sincerely desire to know God in a greater way. And we honor our bishop this morning. Bishop, we bless you this morning. We thank you, Bishop, for the person that you are. And I was actually reflecting this morning, and I said, you know, I have been working out my salvation for a little over a decade. And to be honest with you, I've been derailed probably more than once. <laughs> and so when I think of the perseverance of our bishop in pioneering and being committed to the work of God, it is something that I can honestly say I truly cannot comprehend just yet. And thank you, Pastor Tammy, for being the woman that you are. Thank you for being an example. And thank you for being a standard to the body of Christ for what a mother looks like and what a wife looks like and what a shepherd of God's people looks like. And members, we honor you, every person again, Welcome. Thank you to all of our volunteers. Again, just echoing what Pastor Tammy has said. And as we venture into the scripture this morning, the title that I have for today is called Honest Love. Honest Love. Go ahead and just type that in the comment box so that I know you're there. Honest Love. Honest Love. And I want to start off with a little humor this morning. I'm going to tell you a brief story of early on, my wife and I, when we were married, she would ask me this question, and she would say, Justin, why do you love me? And my response, I can already tell you, to all of our women, you would not approve of my response to her every time. And my response was, Atiyah, I do not know why I love you. <laughs> And honestly, what that was with me, that was me sincerely trying to navigate a response that I truly believed was from my heart. And so what I would tell her is, Atia, if I knew the reason I loved you and that attribute about you was to change, then would I still love you? But the desire is simply there, and I'm enjoying the attributes along the way. So what we're going to do we're going to get ready to dive into the text. And the online experience, of course, is different than being in person. And I truly enjoy every week seeing the comments. I truly enjoy seeing the dialogue that goes back and forth. And I encourage you today, as I begin to open the bread of life and minister this word, I want to go back later. I want to read what you have to say about it. So we're going to read this text. We're going to start off in Mark chapter 12, and we are going to pray, and we are going to dive into this subject of honest love. Mark chapter 12, starting at verse 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? This is a question to Jesus from someone who was well-versed in the scripture of the law of Moses. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel. Now understand, in context, that word hear, it translates understand. 
So what Jesus is about to say, he's saying, you need to comprehend what I'm about to tell you in my response to this, Israel. The Lord our God is one, not many, but one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all. Somebody just type in the comment box, all. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, all of thy soul, and all of thy mind, and all of thy strength. This is the first commandment. Or can we say this another way? This is the superior elder commandment of them all. And then we read in verse 31, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment that is greater than these two. Father, we just thank you for this moment in time. Father, we honor your sovereignty today. We honor the essence of who you are as you abide within our life and in your body and within your creation and by the shed blood of Christ. We receive your word into our soul and within our minds today. And Holy Spirit, we pray for you to completely overwhelm us as you illuminate the understanding of our God in this moment. And we praise you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first thought that I want to discuss with you on our platforms, whether it is citychurchno.tv or our YouTube that you are watching from or our Facebook page, the first thought is, how do we love God with all? And I'm going to be honest with you, City Church, this is something that for most of my salvation, I really did not understand this term. And it was something that I would think about at times, but even when I would compare my love to God, to my love for my beautiful wife, as wonderful as she is, I would ask myself, do I love Atiyah with all that is within me? And I don't know. I love you a lot, but with everything, that's a challenging question for me to truly analyze. And so now we get to this topic where Jesus makes this statement, and he says that the first commandment is that you are to love God with all that is within you. And I would say, wow, God, I just don't know. I mean, I woke up this morning on the wrong side of the bed, and I mean, I don't know, God, if I doubt you sometimes, does it mean that I not love you with all? If my faith is challenged, if I don't make all of the perfect decisions in the day, God, I just cannot comprehend this first commandment. And then I came personally to this realization that to love God with all of your soul or your heart or your mind is to honestly assess the substance of these areas, okay? Now let's talk about what the heart is for a moment. The heart historically has been viewed as the seat of life. Literally, it is the organ we know that pumps blood through the body, so it was viewed as that organ which actually gives a person life. And so when we look at the Greek translation of that word heart, we get two things. That is the soul and that is the mind. The heart, which is the seat of life, is actually the seat that occupies the soul and it occupies the mind. The soul being the affections of a person, the feeling of a person, the desires of a person, and the mind representing the thoughts and the understanding. If you remove these two things from a human being, you know what you have? A corpse. Because we literally 
make decisions every day based on the soul and based on the mind. And one would say, well, you know, I shouldn't walk by feelings. Well, the truth of the matter is, in a perfect world, I don't know. Maybe you could be led by the Spirit for every single thing that you do. But in essence, we make decisions according to desire and according to feeling. And desire and feeling is dictated in part by our mind, by our thoughts, and by our understanding of how we perceive life. So now when we look at how does a person love God with all of their soul? How does a person love God with the desires that lurks within them that sometimes we may even be shameful of? How does a person love God with the affections that we wrestle with as human beings? How do you love God with all of that that resides within us? And I have something for you. To only acknowledge the aspect of your soul that you believe is pleasing to God and to say, God, I love you with this part of me, with this desire of me that desires you and you negate or you neglect that aspect of you that you feel is less desirous. Do you know what you just did? You just decided to love God with a portion of your soul. But the first commandment of our Lord is to love God with all to love God with every fiber of your very existence, not to leave something out because you believe it does not fit into the category or the equation of that which is acceptable to God, but to love God with the essence of who you truly are and not that which you would like to be. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Let's look at this word, so. The word psyche that we use now in the modern English language is actually a word that has progressed from the Greek translation of the word soul. That word psyche is the exact same word. I want to read this scripture to you, Psalms chapter 43, verse 5. This is King David of Israel who is acknowledging something about his soul. And we're going to see that he acknowledges the feeling of his soul, and at the same time, he acknowledges the affection that he has based on the thoughts that he has about God. And so the scripture reads in Psalms 43, 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Have you ever wondered why sometimes your soul feels low? Have you ever silently wondered, even when you are in the midst of the assembly at times, and we put a smile on our face and we lift our hands and we praise God, sometimes absent from the understanding of why we praise him, and we still have this desire within us that is low. David is acknowledging this. He says, why are you down, my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? And then he sets his affection upon his knowledge of God. And he says, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my continence. He had the understanding that God is literally, this word health translates, Yeshua, which is the salvation and the deliverance of the very presence of my being. So although I acknowledge that my soul is low, I would not overlook the fact that my soul is low, but I have the knowledge for whatever reason I have gone through in my life and how I've experienced God, I know that you are the Yeshua of my continence. And for that reason of my knowledge, I will praise you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. When I was walking with the Lord for a season, I began to question so many things. And I'm going to be honest with you, church. 
It was a season where I wrestled with my affections towards the Lord. I questioned and I did not know how to fully understand how to set my desires on a God when I could not understand while I was going through the turmoil and the suffering in my life. It was a state of uncertainty. And you know what? When I was low to that point, I did not care about pretending the current state of my soul. I simply acknowledged the state of my soul, and I came in prayer at times, and sometimes I never went to prayer at all. And as I would go, I would say, God, I don't understand this. I don't understand what's going on, but according to your word, you're faithful. So this is my prayer to you. I want you to win no matter what in my life. And I can remember a time where my son, my oldest son, Jackson, Something happened to him physically. Most people don't even know what happened. I never really discussed it. Maybe my mother, hey mom, hey grandma. Maybe they, y'all know about this only. But something happened to my son where he was agonizing in pain. And this is when my soul was low. And Atiyah called me that Jackson could not stop crying over this thing that has happened to him. And so I did what I felt like I knew how to do, even in the midst of me not understanding, and I prayed to God in the name of Jesus. And I remember getting to the clinic. I laid hands on my son. I got a call from Atiyah later, and she said, all of the pain is gone from him. He's not crying. He's okay. The thing was, he had test results that came back that they at the clinic that showed that there may be something within him. Took him back to the clinic two days later, Everything had vanished. Nothing was there. No more pain. He never experienced it again from this point. And that is something that is in my mind. So now when I honestly assess what happens to my soul and my desires are low, I remember that. And I say, God, I don't understand it all, but I remember this one thing. When I prayed to you, in the name of Jesus, you removed whatever it was from my son in a moment. And we are to love God with the sincerity and the honesty of everything that is within us. And I want to talk about this subject of the mind. The mind. The mind, as we discussed, is defined as the thoughts and the understanding of us. I propose this question to you, City Church family. And to all of our viewers, do you love God with your doubt? Do you love God with the aspect of you that doubts? And before you jump on me, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. A scripture that has so blessed me. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. If we believe not, our God remains faithful. Do you know why? Because God's sovereignty is greater than the strength of our belief. And sometimes when we approach God with desiring to love him, we have this tendency to put more confidence in the strength of our belief as opposed to the faithfulness of God. And when the truth boils down to the state of our salvation, it's not that we found God, it's God found us. So this demonstrates that God's sovereignty and God's love for us is greater than how much we can conjure up a false desire to say that we love him. Love the Lord thy God with all of thy soul, with all of thy heart, with all of thy mind, and with all of our strength. Do you know what happens when we ignore the reality of what is within us and we bring a portion of our soul, heart, and mind to the Lord, 
What happens instead of us coming directly to God through the shed blood of Christ is we create an idolatrous version of ourself. And we push that idol towards God and we say, God, I will love you with this idolatrous false version of me because I feel like this version of me is more acceptable than me. Oh my God, I hope I'm talking to somebody. And I want to talk to you about strength. About strength. We are to love God with all of the strength that is within us. Whoo! Does the scripture say we are to love God with great strength? Or does the scripture say we are supposed to love God with all of it, regardless of that which amount it is? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. The Apostle Paul makes this statement. He says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. He says, I take pleasure in this. I like it. This is what I boast about. And then he says, for when I'm weak, when I'm weak, then I am strong. <laughs> Do you hear me today, City Church? When I acknowledge that I am not as strong as I would like to be, that is when we get the revelation of God's sovereignty. Do you know what we need, City Church? We need God's sovereignty. Oh, God. We need God's intervention. We need God's faithfulness. We need the same love of God that overtook us in the beginning to overtake us now. My God. You know, Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be cast into the sea. I just love how Jesus did not say, if you have faith the size of a mountain. I love how Jesus said, how he did not say, if you have faith the size of a mountain. But Jesus said, if you have just a little bit of faith, not a lot of fabricated faith, this fabrication of what you think it should be and how you're trying to portray yourself. But if you just got a little bit of the real thing, you can say to this mountain, be moved into the sea. Because the other aspect of your faith will boil down to God's faithfulness and God's sovereignty. Hallelujah. And now, let's talk about this thought. Let's move back to the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 31. The second commandment. Keep in mind, Jesus said what we just talked about, loving the Lord thy God. This is the first commandment. And they are ranked. They are not the same. One is first, and one is second. And Jesus said, on these two commandments hangs all of the law and all of the prophets on these two things. It hangs everything upon them. That means that if we negate the fact of giving all of ourselves to the love of God in sincerity, then that means that we would never grasp the understanding of what the law and the prophets was intended for. And so now we move to the second commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment that are greater than these. Wow. Do you know how much you love yourself? Just get a paper cut. Your entire body responds. Just, just get into some type of physical state where you feel like it's a possibility you can lose your life and you will realize how much you fight for your life. It's the self-preservation of life. 
as people, we love life and we love ourselves. And we are to love our neighbor as that same. So let's look at this question. Who is my neighbor? Go ahead and type that in the comment box as we turn to Luke chapter 10, where Jesus gives a beautiful understanding as he is defining and responding to a question of a scribe. And he answers him with this, Luke chapter 10, verse 29. But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Just imagine this. Just imagine the scene of seeing someone as you're walking by and they are wounded, they are bleeding, and they are in agonizing pain of desperation. Imagine seeing that sight, not even driving in the car, driving past them, but imagine seeing this sight as you're walking on the street and they're right in front of you. And verse 31 says, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Let's skip to verse 36. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell amongst the thieves. So now Jesus, he tells the story, and he's asking the question. Now you tell me, which one do you think is neighbor? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, go and do likewise. Now get this picture. The priest and the Levite, two positions which literally represents the very holiness of Israel, passed by a man in a broken state, and they went on to fulfill whatever they was doing throughout the course of the day. City Church, do you know what that means? That means that whether you are a sister, a brother to someone, if you are a coworker to someone, if you are a boss to someone on your job, a mother, a father, do you know that your positional standing in a person's life will not automatically cause that person to see you as neighbor? Did you know that when a person's mind is battered, when their soul is, is bleeding, when their heart is crushed, when their strength is depleted, do you know that when they are in that low state, if you pass by them, it does not matter what your position or relationship in their life, they will not recognize you as neighbor. Jesus said that the one who will recognize someone as neighbor is the one who will help me when I am in my low state. Body of Christ, we must understand it does not matter where you are at. Your position in a person's life or family or job will not be enough to cause a person to recognize you as a believer. Did you know that your coworker will look at you as phony? If your coworker's soul is damaged and you are interacting with them in such a way where you do not welcome them into your life and into your heart, they will look at you as phony. Because when they're in their low state on the job, they receive no help from the one who classifies themselves as a disciple of Jesus. And now just when I'm trying to get over this concept, because my God knows I have struggled with truly welcoming my neighbor into my life the way that I should. And by the way, that word love that is being used in this context, agapeo, one of the definitions of that means to welcome. It just simply means to open up. So when we are saying to love thy Lord, we are saying 
God, I welcome you. And when we're using the word with, with our soul, with all of our mind, that word with translates out of. So we are saying, God, I welcome you out of this area of my life. So now we get to this meaning. I want to talk to you of another thought, and we're getting ready to land the plane shortly. The next thought I want to discuss is new neighbor. Somebody say, we have a new neighbor. Just as I'm trying to get over loving my neighbor, first of all, as I'm walking with the Lord, I'm first trying to wrap my mind around loving my God. Then I have to worry about loving my neighbor. And now Jesus, he brings in a new neighbor to move in next to me. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. New neighbor. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It reads, Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. Oh my. But I said unto you, love your enemies. We're just going to pause right there. You can read the rest of the verse on your own because all the rest of the verse is doing is going into more detail of how to love your enemy. First of all, to classify someone as an enemy, <laughs> that is a strong title to give someone. I mean, I, I really don't know how many people I have that I would put them in the category and label you and say, you are my enemy in opposition of me. But Jesus says, you are now to love. <laughs> you are to welcome. <laughs> As you are passing by and someone is yelling out slanderous things about you, you're on the job and you just can't figure out why your boss seems to be mistreating you. Jesus is now saying, when you hear these words that are being spoken against you and you see the mistreatment, you are supposed to look at your enemy and listen to this statement. You are supposed to recognize the broken heart in your enemy. You are su to supposed to recognize the bruised mind within your enemy, and you are supposed to recognize the battered soul that is behind these words, and you are supposed to see the depleted strength that is within your enemy. And you're supposed to say, brother, sister, I don't know why you're treating me this way. I don't know why you're acting like this, but I see that you are hurting. And for that reason, I will show mercy on you because my God has shown mercy on me. When Jesus was on the cross, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you think that Jesus said that because it was the right thing to do? Or do you think that he said that because he understood the bleeding soul of his accusers? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I want to turn to Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21. And I want to hear your feedback on this one, City Church, your honest feedback. I want to see this in the comment box. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. So we're not even talking about loving from afar. Because to give someone food and drink, you got to be a little close to them in proximity. And then it reads, for thou shalt heap hot coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Now, let me give you this thought. Do you remember, for all of our Bible scholars who are viewing us today, do you remember in Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah He's caught up in this vision, and he sees the train of the robe of the Lord, and he sees the angelic hosts, and they are crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And he's in this atmosphere, and then reality sits in. And as his reality sits in, that fabrication left. 
And he said, God, I am unclean. I dwell amongst the people who are unclean. I am a man of unclean lips. And as he cries this out in his proper analysis of who he is as a prophet of the Lord, the seraphim takes the hot coal from the altar and cleanses his lips. May I present to you today that if you have a love for your enemy, perhaps you can cleanse their mind with the hot coals from the altar of our God. And by your love towards your enemy, they cannot help but have a renewed mind so that they can more effectively now appropriate their love to their God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody just pray for a moment where you're at. Somebody just pray for a moment where you're at. Father, we just thank you for your sovereignty. Oh, my God. God, sometimes I feel like I am so far away from the standard that I am supposed to be. God, sometimes I feel like when I take a proper look of that which lies within me, I don't understand how I am supposed to bring this aspect of me to love you. City Church, I'm going to close with this scripture, Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. May I remind you today that the first commandment is to love the Lord, thy God, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, with all of our heart. Let me tell you this thought. We are to have an allegiance to God first, and then we are to love people. We are to have an allegiance to God first, and then we are to love people. For the first commandment is to love thy God with all that are in us. Do you know what happens to a person? Do you know what happens to a believer when they bring into the body of Christ an internal concept of having an allegiance to people and trying to love God? You are pledging an allegiance to a creation that is fallen. How can we pledge an allegiance to a creation that is fallen and still love God who is perfect? Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5 says, Cursed is the man who puts his trust in man and his hope in the flesh, whose heart departs from the Lord. The scripture that Jeremiah says when he quotes this, you have to understand Jeremiah is already in the process. He is prophesying the captivity of Judah. He is telling Judah, Babylon is coming for you. They are coming for you. And I'm going to tell you this in the process. You are cursed if you put your hope in flesh. And because you have neglected this first commandment, because you have pledged your allegiance to a fear of man, Babylon, they are now coming for you. May we love the Lord thy God with every version of us. No matter the version of what we think it looks like or what we think is acceptable, may we recognize that we are a broken creation in desperate need of the redemption of our Lord. May we bring everything that we are into the love 
for our God. May we welcome God. May we welcome God from our mind. May we welcome God from our soul. May we welcome God even when we are in a low point of disbelief in our strength. God, I welcome you with everything that is within me. God, I welcome you with everything that is within me. Lord, we repent before you. If this resonates with you, I want you to pray with me. Lord, we repent before you for the fabrication of what we present before you. Father, I repent for presenting an idolatrous version of myself to worship you. Oh, my God, I repent for not being sincere and being honest in my analysis of who you are. Father, I repent. I repent for not being truthful in my love towards you. Do you know what you can experience when the sovereignty of God invades your mind? When the sovereignty and the faithfulness of God invades the essence of who you are? Do you know how you will feel when you are at a low point and then you look up one day and say, God, where have you brought me from? God, how have you redeemed me? God, how have you saved me? Even though I'm like this, God, and all we can do is fall on our knees in a reverence and a fear for our God and say, God, you are holy. God, you are sovereign. I don't understand your plan. I don't understand your ways. But all I can do is shake before you in a holy reverence that, God, your redemption has rescued me once again. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. To everyone who is viewing, I encourage you, as you leave from this day, as you leave from this moment, continue to meditate, continue to reflect upon the scripture, continue to reflect upon the essence and the reality of who God is. Because I'm telling you, if something is not working, something is broken, and we cannot ignore that. Please do not try to continue serving God in such a way where you are hoping for some form of results and they never come and you never question, God, am I being sincere in my analysis of how I approach you? We need the real God. I encourage you, remain in some form of a fellowship with other people, with other believers, where you can have these healthy dialogues. We have a place. We have belong groups. They are virtual within the church. You can go on our website. You can look up a belong group, and you can see a place where you can have a form of healthy dialogue and conversation where you can talk in transparency and discuss the reality that is within the scriptures. I encourage you today, as you venture throughout your week, look to approach our God with the sincerity and honest of heart. Thank you to all of our visitors, to all of our members. We are so glad that you decided to worship with us today. Please continue to be in prayer for us, be in prayer for the house of God, and we will continue to be in prayer for you. We are all going in that same direction towards the goodness and the glory of our God. May we show love to one another. May we extend mercy to one another. And may we not give each other an unnecessary stumbling block as we all work our salvation out with fear and trembling. We love you. And until we meet again, you be blessed and have a wonderful week. Hey, thanks for watching the City Church YouTube channel. If you've enjoyed this message, take a moment and click the subscribe button. That way you won't miss another message. 
If you've been blessed in any way by this ministry and you want to partner with us in taking the gospel of Jesus Christ around the globe, you can click the link in the description below to give now. Again, thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.